Some of our most popular healthcare triage episodes have been about food, or rather, they've been about the science and research behind food and the recommendations groups make about what you should or shouldn't eat. Good news, I've got a book on that topic coming out on November 7th. This isn't the real copy, it's just a pre-publication one. It'll be hardback. It's called The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully. You can pre-order it right now, and it's also the topic of this week's healthcare trio. Recently, an old friend of mine was in town for a visit. He loves food, as do my wife and I, so we took him out to a nice restaurant here in Indiana. They do exist. When it came time to order our entrees, I found myself in an all too common predicament. Should I order the healthy option or the one that sounded the tastiest? Luckily, I've become somewhat of an expert on this type of dilemma, and so I chose the tenderloin. It proved to be one of the best pieces of meat I've ever eaten. My wife and our friend ordered dishes that they thought were healthier. They didn't seem to enjoy their meals as much as I did, but they could console themselves with the knowledge that they'd made the right choice in the long run. Had they? It depends on whom you ask. Today, self-professed experts of all stripes, from doctors to dietitians, weight loss gurus to personal trainers, bloggers to YouTubers, and everyone in between seem to have radically different opinions about what we should be eating and why. All of those viewpoints, well-intentioned though they may be, buffet us with wave after wave of dietary advice that promises to make us thinner, cure us of disease, or prevent it entirely, and ultimately extend our lives. We should eat like cavemen did. We should avoid gluten completely. We should eat only organic, or vegetarian, or vegan. These different waves of advice push us in one direction, then another. More often than not, we end up right where we started, but with thinner wallets and thicker waistlines. If you have a hard time keeping all of these recommendations straight or choosing between them, you're not alone. I've had a particular interest and lots of training in analyzing health research, including dietary research. And even I find my head spinning when I think about the number of different perspectives on something as seemingly simple as the benefits of brown rice or the dangers of red meat. This is one of the reasons we cover the topic often here at Healthcare Triage. It's also why I decided to focus much of my writing on dietary health. I wanted to be able to advise my patients and you about what healthy eating looks like. And I also wanted to practice it myself. These conflicting opinions about food have one thing in common. The belief that some foods will kill you, or at the very least that these foods are the reason you're not at the weight or the health you'd like to be. Today, the number one killer in much of the Western world is heart disease. We've struggled to come up with nutritional guidelines that could put a dent in the problem. By the 1970s, for example, some scientists came to believe that we were eating too much of some nutrients, especially fats. The nutritional guidelines began to advise us to avoid fats and the meats that accompany them. We were told that those things would kill us. It seemed like sensible advice at the time, but now, several decades after those guidelines were developed, it looks like they might have made some things worse. When people cut fats and meat out of their diet, they had to turn to something else. For diners in the late 20th century, that often meant turning to grains and other carbohydrates. The results weren't always pretty. Obesity rates shot through the roof, as did the incidence of diabetes and heart disease. As it turns out, meat and fats were never really the danger researchers and healthcare professionals made them out to be, at least not to the extent that many experts claimed. Nor was cholesterol. But even as we've begun to appreciate these facts, we found other foods to blame for our problems. Today, we focus on new dangers, including gluten, genetically modified organisms, artificial sweeteners. None of those things are as dangerous as you might think either, but that hasn't stopped medical experts and lay people alike from demonizing them. These reactions and counter-reactions point to an uncomfortable truth about the field of dietary health. Scientists and doctors are often guilty of acting without sufficient evidence, of making recommendations without having sufficient facts. Most of the time, they're trying to do the right thing but often their efforts can have the opposite effect. My goal in this book is to make you a more responsible consumer, both of foods and of the latest research about how foods affect your health. I also wanna show you that it's okay to live a little and not be so worried about what you eat, because in many cases, your fears are probably based on unfounded science. Sometimes this baseless anxiety might actually be hurting you, at the very least, it's robbing you of some potential joy. Let me be clear, the Bad Food Bible isn't about trying to get you to think that some foods and drinks are so good for you that you should start eating or drinking vast quantities of them. Rather, my goal is to show you that foods that have been traditionally thought of as bad aren't necessarily so. 
by marshalling all the available research about the most controversial foods, I aim to cut through the hype, add in the hand wringing, and help you restore sanity to your diet. Just as the first nutritional guidelines in the late 1800s emphasized variety and balance, this book purports to help you find equilibrium in the foods you eat. If that means abandoning the certainty that characterizes so much writing about dietary health, so be it. If it means giving you permission to indulge occasionally, so much the better. If this episode makes you hungry for more information, you can pre-order the Bad Food Bible right now at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local independent bookstore, anywhere you buy books, links below. If you pre-order now, think how satisfied you'll be when it shows up on your doorstep or is set aside at your local independent bookstore the day it comes out. You won't regret it. Healthcare Triage is supported in part by viewers like you through Patreon, a subscription service that allows you to support the show through monthly donations. We'd especially like to thank some of our biggest helpers, including Sam, Joe Sevitz, and Joshua Crow. Thanks, guys. If you'd like to support the show, please feel free to go to patreon.com slash healthcaretriage. We'd also appreciate if you'd like the video and consider subscribing up there. It really helps.